In the United States, violent extremists embark on a campaign of terror nearly two decades before the Oklahoma City bombing. Bank robberies, bombings, escalating acts of destruction. When their agenda turns to murder, FBI counterterrorism experts team up with state police to stop a group of violent radicals before they strike again. In the 1970s, a string of bank robberies and bombings spread fear and destruction along the East Coast. The FBI faced a new breed of criminal, the domestic terrorists. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. For nearly a decade, these self-proclaimed revolutionaries operated underground. Law enforcement vowed to unearth them once and for all. Interstate 80 is an isolated stretch of highway in northern New Jersey. On December 21, 1981, Trooper Philip LaMonaco of the New Jersey State Police makes a routine traffic stop. The driver seems nervous. LaMonaco sees that he has a gun. Put your hands up on the well. Put your license up on the dash! motorist spots the empty police cruiser and stops. He checks to make sure everything is all right. In the snow, he sees the road trooper bleeding and motionless. He uses the police radio Whoa, to call for help. Hear me? State Trooper Barracks, go ahead. I'm here uh, on I-80. I've met a patrol car. What's your name, sir? Troopers on duty at the Blairstown State Police Blairstown Barracks are surprised Johnson. to hear a civilian voice on their radio. Troopers on the ground. He's motionless. I think he's been shot. He's not moving at all. Stay in the car, sir. We're on the way. All available troopers respond to the report of the shooting. We have an officer shot. Officer down. Charles Coe is a major with the New Jersey State Police. Virtually every road trooper that was on duty that day responded to the scene. We're all basically road troopers to start with. That's where we started from. We all knew the dangers involved, and uh, of course you never think it's going to happen to you, and you really don't think it's going to happen to someone like a Phil LaMonica. LaMonica is a legend in the department. Arriving at the scene, Lieutenant Richard Ryan can't believe he's been shot. Initial shot struck Phil in his chest area. He was wearing a bulletproof vest, but the impact of the shots kind of turned him a little. And one of the shots went in under his armpit and went directly into his heart and basically killed him that one shot. Investigators find LaMonaco's service revolver empty. All six rounds fired, indicating the trooper had gone down fighting. Lieutenant John Mendres processes the crime scene finding further evidence of the gun battle. I obtained pieces of glass fragments, 12 9 millimeter bullet casings at the scene. Uh, they were in the snow bank and in the general area. From the size and number of bullet casings, Mendres believes the murder weapon is a 9 millimeter semi-automatic pistol. He searches for the gun 
but it is nowhere to be found. EMTs transfer Philip Lamonaco's body to the hospital as 250 police officers go after his killer. New Jersey and Pennsylvania State Police stop and question motorists. One man remembers seeing two men as they left the scene. They were driving a 1977 Chevy Nova with Connecticut license plates. Police set up checkpoints along the Delaware River. Officers search miles of highway and back roads looking for the killers. The response was overwhelming. People were coming out of the woodwork to help us and offer leads and try to help us find the car, find the people responsible for this. Hours later, a narcotics detective and a state trooper find the Nova. The car has been abandoned on a rural road three miles from the crime scene. Detectives find an empty holster. Troopers search the vehicle for clues. They find several bullet holes in the car's exterior. It was a shot pattern into the hood of the car, into the windshield, and the right front passenger window was shot out, which indicates that he was shooting at the passenger. Investigators suspect it was likely the passenger of the car who murdered Phil LaMonaco. The driver was in such a hurry to ditch the vehicle, he left behind a crucial piece of evidence. On the dashboard in plain sight was a Connecticut driver's license in the name of Barry Eastbury. For now, Eastbury's name and address are investigators only linked to LaMonaco's killer. And I actually left that scene with another trooper and immediately drove to Connecticut to follow up that lead that night. And we proceeded to the address that was in downtown New Haven, Connecticut. The address on the Eastbury driver's license turns out to be a hotel rather than a residence. So it was turning out to be a dead end lead. We met with the FBI later in the morning and they told us that they had been at that same hotel a few months earlier following the lead up on an individual by the name of Raymond Luke Lavasser. Lavasser is one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. Agents believe he is the leader of a violent radical group called the Sam Melville Jonathan Jackson unit. The FBI suspects the group of masterminding a series of bank robberies and bombings. Now investigators wonder whether the group is also responsible for the murder of Trooper Phil Lamonaco. I'd like to take those prints and see if we can match them up. Agents send Lavasser's file to the state lab in New Jersey to compare his fingerprints with those found in the Nova. Unfortunately, none of them matched, which we could not believe. Uh, it just didn't make any sense. Ryan takes a closer look at Lavasser's wanted flyer. I reread the flyer, and on the bottom of small print, right at the last line, it said, may be accompanied by Thomas William Manning. Uh, and, uh, FBI agents pull Manning's file. The photo on his wanted poster is the man they know as Barry Eastbury. Examiners match Manning's file fingerprints to those lifted from the Nova, confirming that Barry Eastbury is an alias for Thomas Manning. If Manning is involved in the murder of Philip LaMonaco, investigators are up against a dangerous fugitive. According to FBI files, Manning met Lavasser in prison, where they both served time on drugs, weapons, and robbery charges. The two men formed a radical group called the Melville Jackson Unit, according to Special Agent Leonard Cross. They were well versed in a lot of guerrilla tactics. They studied guerrilla manuals. They studied a lot of the radical left literature uh, from the uh, late 60s, the mid 60s, and the early 70s. The group began a reign of terror, claiming responsibility for seven bombings in Massachusetts and New York between 1976 and 1979. 
including the bombing of two courthouses, the Middlesex County Courthouse in Lowell, Massachusetts, and the Suffolk County Courthouse in Boston, where 20 people were injured. According to their propaganda, the Melville Jackson unit targets institutions and businesses to protest government and corporate policies they believe are unfair. FBI Special Agent Ed Peterson is investigating the radical group. I think they viewed themselves as some champion of the downtrodden, the poor. Actually, they never did anything for the poor, and you know all they were committed to were acts of violence. Agents believe the group funds its violent political agenda with bank robberies, carefully planned operations that are executed with military precision. It was obvious that these people were not your everyday criminals. They were an organized criminal group who were traveling the New England states and committing numerous crimes, uh, the most serious, obviously, the murder of Trooper LaMonica. On Christmas Eve, 1981, 2,000 law enforcement officers from several states attend the funeral of Trooper LaMonaco. The wave of support overwhelms his wife, Donna. I was just amazed that all the way up, it was a good half mile from the church, cars had started to park to come to the funeral. Phil LaMonaco was one of the most respected troopers in the state of New Jersey. He was a great trooper. He really, really was. And I think one of the main things that made him a great trooper was he really, really loved and respected his job. He was one of the good ones. He was the idol of a lot of young troopers. He had trained a lot of young troopers in the, in the tactics of stopping cars and looking for contraband in vehicles on the highway. Superintendent Clinton Pagano makes Donna LaMonaco a solemn promise. The New Jersey State Police will do everything in their power bring her husband's killers to justice. I just could see in his eyes the sincerity, and I just knew. I just knew he would make sure that from that point is where I grew confidence in knowing they're going to get caught. Whoever they are, they're going to be found, and they're going to get caught, because he promised me. At a nearby municipal building, New Jersey and Pennsylvania State Police work closely with the FBI to find the men who murdered Trooper LaMonaco. The task force follows up on dozens of leads. Firearms investigators ask gun shop owners in the area if anyone has sold 9 millimeter ammunition to a man named Barry Eastbury. They got a hit in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, which is right across the river from the shooting. Three months earlier, a Barry Easterly, not Eastbury, had purchased 9 millimeter ammunition at a gun shop in Stroudsburg. The name seems too close to be a coincidence. If these were the bullets used in the killing, the three-month time span is an important clue. We felt that these people resided in this general area. They weren't just passing through. We were working very closely with the Pennsylvania State Police at that time. We notified them about this find. Pennsylvania State Police. Two days later, the Pennsylvania State Police receive an unusual phone call. A local landlord calls with a complaint. The Pennsylvania State Police was notified by a fellow by the name of Charles Miller, who lived in Marshall's Creek, Pennsylvania, directly across the river in the greater Stroudsburg area. Miller owns several rental properties in the area. A dog has been abandoned inside one of his houses. He's not seen the tenants for nearly two weeks. According to Miller, the house was rented by a man named Barry Easterly. SWAT teams converge on the rented farmhouse. Search the house from room to room. Whoever lived there left in a hurry. The occupants of the house had abandoned clothing, personal photos, and even their dog. In one room, police find radical literature and a sketch featuring an AK-47 assault rifle. In the bedroom, 
they find the tools of domestic terrorists. The map again. We found all types of paraphernalia, information on how to make bombs, bomb-making material. Police also find 9 millimeter bullets, the same caliber that killed Trooper Phil Lamonaco. They believe the rented property is a safe house, where Thomas Manning, his wife and children, lived at the time of the Lamonaco shooting. Investigators find documents that offer fresh insight into the radical group's operations. They apparently were planning to pull a bank robbery in Allentown, Pennsylvania. That's good. We had those schematics. We also found a critique of the bank robbery where several policemen were killed a few years before that. And all of these things they had to leave behind because they left in such haste. In another bedroom, Sergeant Tom Evans finds a small phone book. We began to write down all the phone numbers were in that book. There were no names, there were nicknames, uh, and there was no area code. Police also find a photograph of a man they can't identify. Do you know who that is? Who's this? According to the landlord, the man in the picture lived in the Manning's guest room. The family referred to him as Uncle David. Investigators wonder if Uncle David was Manning's passenger the night of the shooting and whether he is responsible for the murder of Trooper Philip Lamonaco. The search for a cop killer evolves into a manhunt for a group of domestic terrorists. A raid on an abandoned Pennsylvania farmhouse yields two important clues. A mysterious photograph and a book of telephone numbers. Dozens of phone numbers are listed. Sergeant Evans of the New Jersey State Police notes that none of them have area codes. Troopers said to me, those look like Boston phone exchanges. Next morning, we went to Boston. We started to run down the phone numbers to see who we could come up with. There were at least 100 phone numbers in there. One of them had a little note on it said rent. How you doing, sir? The telephone number belongs to a company in Boston that rents out apartments. Investigators meet with the manager. Possibly one of your tenants? I showed him the picture. He said to me, Trooper, I'm sorry, but I hardly ever see these people. They just mail in their checks. It looks like another dead end. The police give the phone book another look. Next to the rental company's phone number, someone has written a figure, $275. So I said to the guy, do you have any apartment building or apartments that rent for $275? The manager tells them the company has only one apartment that rents for that amount. It is currently vacant and being renovated. So we rushed up there and stopped them from repainting the apartment. Uh, Massachusetts State Police got their forensic people in there. The apartment has been thoroughly cleaned, but investigators find fingerprints in obscure places on a light bulb and behind the toilet in the bathroom. The tenant left no forwarding address, according to the building supervisor. So at that point, the guy said to me, well, you ought to talk to his girlfriend. At 2 o'clock in the morning, police interview the suspect's girlfriend. Is there any information or anybody that you know? Although she does not tell investigators who her boyfriend really is, she gives them the name of his stepfather. The next morning, Lieutenant Evans drives to the suburbs outside Boston to question the suspect's stepfather. I showed him the picture, and he said, what has Dickie done now? And I said, Dickie who? And he said, Dickie Williams. We called the command post, gave him Richard Charles Williams' name, they ran that name against the fingerprints that we had, and bingo, it was him. So we had the uh, second person identified. Richard Williams was Thomas Manning's passenger the night Phil LaMonica was murdered. The violent radical is now wanted as a cop killer. 
investigators on the case face an extraordinary challenge, finding a group of fugitives who are as elusive as they are dangerous. New England authorities and the FBI join ranks to track down Manning, Lavasser, and Williams. Special Agent Ed Peterson is assigned to assist the New Jersey police in the manhunt. It was really important as far as the FBI and all of law enforcement to put them under a magnifying glass and to look at every possible contact, you know, to try to think like they would think, you know, to, to try and get into that mindset and to understand, you know, what motivated them and where they would look to go. The task force sifts through hundreds of hours of intelligence on the Melville Jackson unit. According to their files, the fugitives have a history of using different aliases to conceal their identities and various mail drops to hide their locations. We knew that we had a tough job because they did not remain in one place. They didn't do the conventional things that fugitives generally do. They went to such extremes to hide their identities. In 1981, a man walks into the town clerk's office in Brattleboro, Vermont, with an unusual request. He needs a copy of a birth certificate for an infant who died in the early 1950s. The clerk becomes suspicious. Brattleboro is a small town, and she knows the infant's family. How you doing, sir? Do you have any ID on you? No problem. No problem, sir. I just need to see your ID. Get on the ground, but don't do it. Get out now. Get down. Get down. Get down. Get down. Get down. Get down. Get Police later identify the man as Raymond Lavasser after finding his fingerprints in an abandoned vehicle nearby. They suspect he was trying to establish a new identity by stealing the birth certificate of a dead infant. Headed out in the parking lots, white male. In January 1982. Thomas Manning joins Lavasser on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Authorities turn up the heat on the fugitives. Four months later, FBI agent John Markey responds to the scene of a bank robbery. Two masked gunmen had stolen $60,000 from a bank in Burlington, Vermont. According to Agent Markey, the precision of the operation points to the Melville Jackson unit. All three individuals that went into the bank went in right after an armored car delivery. One man stood in the lobby. The other two vaulted the counter. One of them took the money from the teledraws. The other one took the money that had just been delivered. The money in the teledraws was rigged with dye packs. They look like a stack of money when you take them out of a bank, there's an electronic sensor that causes them to activate. And then within seven seconds, they go off, letting off tear gas and a red dye, which dyes the money. They threw about $20,000 out the window because it had dye packs in it. It was apparent to me that we ought to consider Raymond Lavasser and Thomas Manning and maybe his associate, Richard Williams, as possible suspects in that bank robbery. Two months later, three men rob a bank in Syracuse, New York, netting $195,000. The MO is nearly identical to the Burlington robbery, but with one exception. They only took the money that was delivered by the armored car. They did not take any of the money out of the teledraws. That way, they eliminated the possible die packs. It was my opinion that we were dealing with the same people who robbed the South Burlington branch, and you could account for the change of not taking money from the teledraws because they would have discussed the die packs. In just two months, over $235,000 has been stolen from area banks. Authorities are concerned that the Melville Jackson unit is amassing a war chest to finance a new wave of terror. With the threat of more bombings looming, investigators make a difficult decision. They will try to find the terrorists 
by looking for their children. Pictures of the Manning and Lavasser children are distributed to schools, sport clubs, and pediatricians in the area. That was very controversial. We had a lot of conversations as far as distributing the pictures of the children, because the children were innocent in this. They just were living with the parents. They were 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old kids. Investigators feel they have no choice. The group is deadly, and lives are at stake. Unfortunately, the gamble does not pay off. The fugitives have hidden their children well. Thank you. To make matters worse, the gang launches a series of new attacks. On December 16th, police in White Plains, New York, receive a frantic call. An unidentified man has phoned in a bomb threat to a local newspaper. According to the caller, the bomb has been planted in an office building. Fortunately, dozens of employees had evacuated before the building exploded. The blast destroyed nearly every window in the building. Inside, investigators find a communique from a group calling themselves the United Freedom Front. The UFF claims responsibility for the bombing. Agents on the case recognize the UFF's distinctive assault rifle logo. It is nearly identical to a sketch they found in Manning's safe house. We actually compared those side by side. And we decided that the logo looked enough, in our opinion, that it was them. We thought that the United Freedom Front, who took credit for that bombing, was in fact the new name for the people involved in the monarchy killing. That's not all right. Over the next year, the UFF claims responsibility for four more bombings. On December 14, 1983, they call the press to issue a chilling statement. They intend to destroy the offices of a national defense contractor in Queens, New York. The caller indicates that a statement from the group can be found in a Manhattan mailbox. The letter denounces U.S. involvement in Central America the Caribbean and the Middle East. The bomb squad recovers two suitcase bombs before they can detonate. Finding an intact bomb is an important break for Special Agent John Markey. The materials used in that bomb were very similar to the materials used in the Sam Melville, Jonathan Jackson unit bombings in the 70s. The elements of the bomb that was similar was the type of clock used, that the crystal on top of the clock, a hole was melted into the crystal, and a brass screw was screwed in to the crystal. Special Agent Leonard Cross is familiar with the design. He investigated the group's early bombings in the 1970s. In February 1984, Cross becomes the coordinator of the task force hunting the killers. The investigation into the radical group is now in its eighth year. The terrorists have stayed a step ahead of authorities by repeatedly assuming new identities. Agent Cross and the FBI task force decide to take a new approach. What we tried to do was plot where we knew they had lived, safe houses, where they had bombed, where they had committed bank robberies. So we started putting this all up on a map. Slowly but surely, a pattern emerges. The group's activities are concentrated in a four-state area that includes New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, and Connecticut. In the spring of 1984, the FBI launches Operation Western Sweep, a mission designed to close in on the dangerous fugitives. In 1984, the FBI launches Operation Western Sweep, a mission to apprehend three key members of a violent, radical group. Agents believe the group has orchestrated numerous acts of domestic terrorism. The 
New Jersey State Police suspect one of the terrorists also murdered Trooper Phil LaMonaco. Hundreds of investigators comb areas where the group is known to operate. We had the bombing. As agents uncover the group's safe houses, the FBI deploys SWAT teams to search them. But the fugitives are always one step ahead, according to Detective Richard Ryan. It was frustrating because we couldn't apprehend them. But we felt as long as they kept committing crimes, they were still out there. They hadn't gone into total hiding. There was a better chance we could catch them. Agent John Markey tries to predict when the terrorists will strike again. Based on the group's unique lifestyle, he develops an ingenious theory. There were a series of four bank robberies in 1982 and 1983 in Upper State New York along Interstate 90 between Syracuse and Albany, New York. Markey divides the total amount of money stolen by the number of days between robberies. He calculates that the group is operating on a budget of about $737 per day. Based on that, you could predict when the next robbery would occur. I was predicting that the next robbery would be between June 1st and June 14th of 1984. Markey's prediction is right on target. On June 9th, the gang hits a bank in Norfolk, Virginia. The ammo is familiar. Three armed men enter the building. Two of them jump the counter. They subdue bank personnel at gunpoint. Ignoring the cash in the drawers, they grab bags of money that have just been delivered by an armored car service. They did not take any of the money out of the teledraws. That way they eliminated the possible die packs, bait money, and sounding the alarm. The gang seems to be getting smarter with each new robbery. Investigators need a lead, however small, to break the case wide open. Special Agent Ed Peterson. We knew no matter how good any fugitive thinks he or she is, no matter how good they think they are, some point and some time, they're gonna make a careless mistake. In the summer of 1984, the fugitives make that crucial mistake. On August 4th, the owner of a storage facility in Binghamton, New York, contacts the FBI. One of his customers hasn't paid his bill in two years. The manager opened the storage unit so he could auction off the contents. What he found inside terrified him. The contents in there included materials on how to make bombs, how to handle firearms training, research on various corporations, uh, and a lot of radical material, uh, and a lot of Marxist-type literature. Agents find bomb-making diagrams in the storage unit. They show a timer assembled with brass screws. Earlier in the investigation, agents found an unexploded bomb with similar brass screws at one of the group's targets. The bomb is designed to detonate a massive bundle of dynamite with a single electric charge. The distinctive design links Lavasser and his gang to bombings all over the Northeast. There are hundreds of pieces of evidence in the storage unit. Investigators follow up on every clue, no matter how obscure. The magazines taken out of the storage bin in Binghamton, New York, at first nobody thought there would be of any value. But an address label on an old seed catalog reveals a new name in the investigation, Jack Horning. Investigators trace the address to Ansonia, Connecticut. According to neighbors, the Horning family moved away years earlier. The trooper that was assigned to this lead felt, again, we have another dead-end lead. However, he continued to interview people in the neighborhood, and he developed a babysitter who had lived a few houses down, and she babysat for the Horning children. 
teenager remembers the Hornings well. She tells the trooper that Mrs. Horning was a normal mom. The kids were well behaved. The entire time she worked for the Hornings, nothing out of the ordinary happened. But then she remembers one small incident. One day she was out with Mrs. Horning and they had a motor vehicle accident. On a hunch, the trooper follows up with the Connecticut Department of Motor Vehicles. He is unable to find an accident report involving a Mrs. Horning. But one report does match the time and location of the incident. The key was that the babysitter was listed on the accident report as a passenger in that vehicle. The name the driver gave police at the time was not Horning, but Himes. This is interesting. Judy Himes' Connecticut license has since expired. It was traded for a New York license in 1980. Later, the New York license was turned in for an Ohio license. According to DMV records, the Ohio license is still current. Judy Himes' name, along with her address in Columbus, is forwarded to Sergeant Tom Evans. So I called the Columbus Police Department. Yeah. And I said, what is at that address? And the guy said to me, it's a mail drop. And a mail drop meant that's them, that that's their MO, that's what they use. They didn't have mail sent to their home. In Columbus, the FBI rents a vacant house across the street from the mail drop. From there, agents can monitor the facility with video cameras. The mail drop is a 24-7 operation. So this was going to be difficult to surveil. On November 3rd, three and a half weeks into the stakeout, a woman arrives at the mail drop. Investigators visually identify her as the wife of Raymond Lavasser. It's the first time now in probably over 10 to 12 years that any law enforcement agency had any of these people actually in sight under surveillance. So you can imagine how the adrenaline was pumping. The fugitive's wife is law enforcement's only link to the terrorists. Rather than making an arrest, agents follow her, hoping she will lead them to her husband. In 1984, the FBI and a multi-state task force trail a group of domestic terrorists. The violent radicals are suspected of a series of bank robberies and bombings. And the murder of a New Jersey state police trooper. Investigators track the group from a safe house in Connecticut to a mail drop in Columbus, Ohio. After nearly a decade, their only lead to the terrorist's location is the wife of gang leader Ray Lavasser. Agents follow her as she leaves the mail drop. They know that like the rest of the group, Lavasser's wife is skilled at covering her tracks and at spotting a tail. They're careful to keep their distance, using aerial surveillance as a backup in case she slips away. Detective Richard Ryan. She was on and off the highway numerous times, stopping, starting, looking around, taking local roads back onto the interstate, back off. So it was a difficult surveillance. Two and a half hours later, the target stops at a house in Deerfield, Ohio. Once she arrived at the house, a surveillance was set up in the area from different locations as best as they could. And it was a very rural area. There were uh, farmers' fields, corn fields, things of that nature. New Jersey State Trooper Richard Tao watches the house from a distance. Approximately 20 minutes later, a male subject left the house and got in his car and left the area. The male subject is Richard Williams, the man wanted for the murder of New Jersey State Trooper Philip LaMonaco. FBI agents follow Williams to a safe house in Cleveland. They now have two houses under surveillance, 
60 miles apart. In one location, we had the suspected murderer of Trooper Philip LaMonica. In the second location, we had top 10 FBI fugitive Ray LaVosser. Surveillances continued through the night and into the morning. Around 9.40 AM, the LaVassers leave their house. All right, fellas. Go, 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 go. The SWAT team moves in. They arrest Ray Lavasser along with his wife. The call then immediately went out to Ohio, up to Cleveland, that Lavasser was in custody. So now a decision was made to raid the Cleveland, Ohio house. In Cleveland, agents and police surround the home of Richard Williams. Williams, a suspected murderer and terrorist, gives up without a fight. After years of work, the task force has captured two of the group's three key men in less than an hour. We had Ray Lavasser and his wife. We had Dickie Williams. The only remaining fugitives that we had was Tom Manning and his wife. Agents question Richard Williams about Thomas Manning's location. Williams stalls for hours. With every passing moment, the fugitives have more time to escape. Finally, Williams breaks down and reveals the addresses of three safe houses located in Jefferson, Ohio. One of them belongs to Thomas Manning. We proceeded to that location and conducted a very extensive search. Williams' stall tactics have given the Mannings enough time to flee, but not enough time to cover their tracks. Inside their safe house, investigators find handguns, fake IDs, and $32,000 in cash. They also find a 1,000-page record of the group's activities. In one room, agents find a police scanner tuned to a frequency used by the FBI. In another room, they find explosives and bomb-making supplies. They also find a bomb kit that contains distinctive brass screws that match unexploded bombs recovered in 1976 and 1983. They recover a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. At the FBI forensics lab, technicians analyze the gun. They compare the bullet that killed Trooper Philip LaMonaco to bullets fired from the 9mm handgun. We were able to determine that that was the weapon that was used to kill Phil LaMonaco. Although they have finally found the murder weapon, tracing the owner of the gun will be difficult. The serial number has been filed off. Technicians use a chemical solution to raise the number. It is barely legible beneath the surface of the metal. Agents trace the 9mm to a gun shop in Norfolk, Virginia. There it was purchased by a woman named Deborah Ann Fury. Fury had listed an address in Virginia Beach. Investigators check out the location. It turns out to be another mail drop. The surveillance team waits to see who will collect the mail. When a woman arrives and opens the box, agents identify her. Deborah Ann Fury is in reality Thomas Manning's wife. The FBI has finally found a link to the last member of the radical terrorist group. In Ohio, 
The FBI and police have arrested key members of a violent radical group charged with robbery and domestic terrorism. One of them, Richard Williams, is suspected of killing a police officer. Two of the group's members, Thomas Manning and his wife, are still at large. It has been five months since Manning and his family fled their safe house in the rural town of Deerfield. The FBI traces a gun found in the safe house to an address in Virginia Beach, Virginia. As it turns out, the address is another mail drop. After weeks of surveillance, agents spot the fugitive's wife picking up the mail. Special Agent Leonard Cross. We knew she had a scanner and she'd be scanning for police radio frequencies as well as FBI frequencies. We had special radios that were all encrypted that could not be picked up. And the surveillance uh, at this point uh, took us north. Manning's wife leads investigators to a safe house in Norfolk about 20 miles away. do not want to arrest her until they can be sure her husband is at home. An hour later, investigators follow her to a nearby shopping center. As an arrest team takes her into custody, a second team moves in on the safe house. Manning is now outside, unaware he's being watched. He had no weapons. A decision was made so no one would get hurt. This would be the time to make the arrest. Get up, 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 get up. Don't resist. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Thomas Manning, the last of the terrorists, is arrested in his own backyard. In 1987, Thomas Manning and Richard Williams stand trial in Somerville, New Jersey. Donna Lamonaco widow of Trooper Phil LaMonaco attends the trial. It was very important for me to be a part of the trial. I needed to be there. I needed to know exactly what went on. Uh, I wanted to make sure they were the two that killed Phil. The two self-proclaimed revolutionaries are sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Trooper Philip LaMonaco. They receive additional sentences for their roles in a series of bank robberies and bombings starting in 1975. In separate trials, the wife of Thomas Manning is found guilty of conspiracy and sentenced to 15 years. Raymond Lavasser receives 45 years in prison for his role in the group's terrorist activities. His wife is released after spending several months in custody. I think it's really important to set the record straight that these individuals, Lavasser, Manning, Williams, they were nothing but criminals. These guys want to call themselves as freedom fighters, uh, revolutionaries. At the end of the day, they were criminals. And that's the bottom line. I mean, when you commit bank robberies, when you set off bombs, when you kill a police officer who's only out there doing his job, they, they, they were nothing more than criminals. After the trials, Members of the New Jersey State Police visit Phil LaMonaco's grave for the very first time. We went as a group to his gravesite. We felt that uh, we had the respect of Phil. He would know that we had done our best. Two decades after Philip LaMonaco's death, people still leave flowers and flags on the side of the New Jersey highway he protected. In Washington, D.C., a notorious drug gang threatens an entire neighborhood. Witnesses are intimidated or killed. Even as the police and the FBI build a case against the killers, the body count continues to climb. Drug sales skyrocket as a neighborhood becomes a virtual war zone. Now the FBI must find the key to destroying a deadly gang known throughout the city as the K Street Crew.
1990s, the war on drugs was in full swing. The front lines were often America's inner cities, where gangs used violence and murder to rule their empires. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When gang violence exploded in Washington, D.C., the Metro Police and the FBI fought back. Using high-tech surveillance and tough new laws, they set out to destroy the gangs from the inside out. Washington, D.C. In this city of monuments and museums lies the heart of American justice, the Supreme Court, the Department of Justice, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. But even our nation's capital is not immune to crime. March 22, 1991. 20-year-old Wendy York returns home after running errands. Teresa! She shares an apartment with her cousins, Tarita and Teresa Lucas. Teresa is in the living room, lying on the couch. Her face is covered with blood. Oh, my God! Wendy runs from the apartment and calls 911. An emergency dispatcher directs units to the scene. DC Metro Police arrive at the apartment within minutes. Teresa Lucas has been shot through the head. In a back bedroom, they find another body and a child. The second victim is Teresa's sister, Tarita. She has also been shot in the head. Her child is unharmed. Police discover another baby, terrified, but also unharmed. It's Teresa's child. It seems both children have been alone with the bodies for hours. A short time later, the victim's mother arrives at the apartment. Renee Brown finds the building surrounded by police. My mind was racing, and I was trying to get in. The police were holding me back. They said, you can't get in. I said, this is my house. I have to go in. That was the most horrific day of my life. I will never forget it. They were very devoted and dedicated mothers. They loved their kids, and, um, and they didn't deserve to die. Crime scene investigators process the apartment. They find no signs of forced entry. Nothing in the apartment appears to be disturbed. No valuables have been taken. There is nothing that suggests a motive for the brutal slaying. Detectives suspect the victims knew their killer. Detectives ask Renee Brown to check the apartment. The grieving mother is willing to do anything she can to help. Renee notices something missing from Teresa's bedroom. The first thing I noticed was that a poster-sized picture that was there the previous night had disappeared from off the wall. A frame is found, but a photo of Teresa's boyfriend, Sam Carson, is gone. And I told the detective then, I said, I wonder where that picture is. And we looked in the trash in the back and it was nowhere in the trash, so I said, whoever has that picture is the murderer. Police contact hey, Sam. Sam Carson to ask him a few questions. He denies being in the apartment the night the two women were murdered. Although Carson is a likely suspect, police have no physical evidence to tie him to the murders. Detectives interview people in the neighborhood. Although gunshots were fired in the Lucas apartment, neighbors claim they heard nothing. Did you happen to know the women? No. 
Two young women have died, and yet nobody is willing to talk about it. The double homicide catches the attention of law enforcement across the district, including the FBI. Special Agent Vince Lissy is shocked by the brutality of the crime. Agent Lissy often works undercover and must protect his identity. It was horrific. The police had very few leads to go on. Uh, they struggled and struggled with the investigation for some time, but there were no real witnesses to it. Without a witness, police cannot identify a suspect. Without a motive, they cannot catch the Lucas girl's killer. And without evidence, the double homicide will become a statistic. Yet another unsolved murder in a city plagued by violence. The epicenter of that violence is Greenleaf Gardens, a housing project on K Street. The drug trade has reduced the neighborhood to chaos, according to Detective Steve Kirshner. Crack cocaine hit the city hard in 85, 86. Along with that came a lot of violence. Their homicide rate went sky high. I believe it started out mostly from jealousy of who was making the most money. There were kidnappings, assaults, just led to a very violent area. Buyers, many of them from the suburbs, made the dealers on K Street rich. The area provided few economic opportunities, so the lure of easy money proved a powerful recruiting tool. It was a huge money maker for them, and it was pretty hard to tell a 14 or 15 year old kid Hey, listen, go to school, do all the right things. Whenever they can go out on the street, sell crack and make $1,000 a day. They could buy all the things that they didn't have before uh, because they live in an impoverished home. With millions of dollars in easy profits at stake, competition between dealers grew fierce. Streets became borders as gangs battled over sales turf. The neighborhood was a powder keg, according to Metro Homicide Detective Tony Brigadini. The area was deadly. Numbers that we have compiled over the years of the investigation show that this was probably one of the most deadly areas in the District of Columbia. It's very close to some of the government buildings in Southwest Washington, which was interesting in that there's an incredible amount of crime going on in a small area so close to a downtown business district. The FBI and DC Metro Police form the Safe Streets Task Force. Their job is to clean up a neighborhood that has become a war zone. Agents canvassed the streets, looking for information on the gangs. Residents are too afraid to talk, or even be seen speaking with investigators. If you walk up to somebody's door and you knock on their door and ask to speak to them, in about three minutes, everybody in that neighborhood is going to know that the police are there. Frustrated by the lack of cooperation, agents try a different approach. Sometimes we follow people to work. We try to get them away from a neighborhood. We try to do whatever we can so that the people in the neighborhood don't know their witnesses. Slowly, the residents open up. They talk about drug dealers who have taken over the neighborhood the K Street crew. The gang is led by Vincent Hill, a ruthless sociopath who seems to thrive on violence. If somebody came up and irritated him for any reason whatsoever, he had no problem grabbing a baseball bat, a hammer, anything he could, and hit them with it. Hill's money and his brutality make him the most powerful man in the neighborhood according to Metro Detective Neil Trugman. He compared himself to a big-time mob figure. 
they, there was no fear. According to FBI sources, Vincent Hill runs the K Street crew with an iron fist. Still, gang members respect him. Vincent Hill had a reputation for being a bully, but at the same time, others looked up to him because they saw that he had money, he had nice clothes, uh, he had fancy cars. While he's manipulating them into selling drugs, they would see him beat somebody up for not giving him enough money. So all of these things kind of led the others to look to him as somebody that you didn't want to mess with, you didn't want to challenge, but at the same time, he was a way that they could make money. The distribution of crack cocaine carries severe penalties. A conviction could get Vincent Hill and his crew off the streets permanently. I think they're going to start selling a lot of marijuana. Agents launch an investigation into the gang's crack dealing, but Hill's group is already one step ahead. Before the FBI can bust the K Street crew on cocaine charges, the gang suddenly shifts to selling marijuana. They realized when they were selling crack cocaine, you're looking at stiff time. Selling marijuana was a misdemeanor. More than likely, you wouldn't get any time for it. The demand is huge. Buyers pour in from the suburbs. The gang maintains its profits, minimizing the risk of jail time. It just took off like a rocket. Everybody was making money. Uh, you know, people were making three, four, five thousand dollars a day just by selling marijuana. Thwarted by the gang's move, the task force regroups as the dealers grow even bolder. Uh, I would drive by in unmarked cars, and they would hold bags of marijuana up, three for 20, three for 20. And then when they finally got close enough to realize they were a cop, they would run. The dealers simply abandon their stashes until the cops leave. Minutes later, the dealers return to the exact same spot with a new stash and set up shop again. As business expands, the violence escalates, sometimes involving innocent victims. On August 29th, 1992, Travis Ross and two friends are mistaken for rival drug dealers. Ross is killed instantly. Both of his friends are critically wounded. Police interview the survivors. They say they have no idea who shot them or why. Their reluctance to answer questions is understandable. Police believe the K Street crew has already murdered a dozen people who cooperated with authorities. What they don't know is how the gang is able to identify these potential witnesses. In 1995, Bruce Spencer is shot five times at point-blank range by a K Street crew member. Somehow he survives. He is willing to identify the man who shot him. The task force immediately places Spencer in protective custody. He's registered at a DC hospital under the name John Doe. While Spencer recuperates, Agent Lissy and other investigators scour Greenleaf Gardens looking for the men who tried to kill him. On K Street, Agent Lissy and Detective Trugman find themselves face to face with Vincent Hill, the gang's notorious leader. I said, look, all your witnesses are going to die, every one. Even your buddy who's in the hospital under the name John Doe in room, and he told me exactly what room it was. And uh, I shook my head as if I didn't know what he's talking about, but I knew exactly what he was talking about. They wanted to let us know that it was their business to locate witnesses and silence them. 
Investigators are even more determined to protect their witness. But word of Hill's threat reaches Spencer. Fearing for his life, the witness refuses to help investigators. I'm through, man. I'm through. Everything's working out. Right. Almost not. The task force is frustrated, having lost another battle in their war against the K Street crew. In the 1990s, Greenleaf Gardens in the southwest section of Washington, D.C., is a neighborhood under siege. A gang calling itself the K Street Crew has claimed the housing project as its base of operations and turned it into a killing zone. Metro Police, working closely with the FBI, struggle to link the gang to a rash of killings. Investigators know it will take more than individual murder convictions to stop the widespread violence. They need a strategy that will take down the entire gang. The Joint Task Force decides to use RICO, a federal racketeering statute, that will allow them to prosecute the K Street crew as a single corrupt organization that sells drugs and commits murder to protect their interests. Homicide detectives re-examine dozens of cold cases, cases that were once attributed to the random violence of the projects. They search for anything that will link the K Street crew to murder, according to Detective Tony Brigadini. Some of the cases that we were investigating were eight years old, 10 years old. We would have to go back and research case jackets, try to find evidence that had been collected eight or 10 years earlier, try to locate crime scene photographs, things of that nature. Yeah, there, here it is. See this car, is that the same car? So, in trying to build a strong case, we were dealing with, with very little information. In the meantime, agents launch a covert surveillance operation to gather evidence on the gang's growing drug business. Special Agent Vince Lissy. We wanted to show the conspiratorial nature of these guys, how they operated on the street, how they took turns selling drugs, who supplied who. And we thought that if we could have undercovers introduced to the group, that we could accomplish this. FBI agents set up a stakeout in an apartment overlooking K Street. The landlord offers it to them free of charge. Like most of the residents of Greenleaf Gardens, he's sick of the drugs and the violence. We got some uh, camera equipment, video, and still photos. And we would sit up there and watch them and try to get uh, the people on K Street's patterns down. We would see Vincent Hill out there and see how he operated. Investigators watch the area for weeks. Once they've established the gang's patterns, they develop a plan. Most of the drug transactions on K Street are conducted with buyers in cars. To get closer to the dealers, they'll need a vehicle. We decided the best approach was to use a pickup truck. We got the oldest, dirtiest pickup truck the FBI had. Uh, we bought some toolboxes and put toolboxes on the back of the truck to make it look like a construction truck. The truck is rigged with surveillance cameras and microphones. Two Metro investigators, Joe Abdallah and Jim Scheider, are recruited from another precinct. As outsiders, they will not be recognized by gang members. They will pose as construction workers to make drug buys. Metro investigator Joe Abdallah. So if me and Jimmy had a prearranged, if I was in any trouble where I felt my, my safety was in jeopardy, I was going to run for that truck and depending on the situation, Jimmy was going to take off with me jumping in the back of that truck, or he would get out with his firearm. The main target of the surveillance operation is Vincent Hill. The undercover officers expect they will have to make several buys before they can make contact with the gang leader. Five cars carrying two-man teams form a perimeter around the neighborhood. They stand by on their radios, awaiting Lissy's orders. 
We had all this in place. We had the car situated throughout the neighborhood. And we said, okay, let's go, let's try it. Nobody moves until our fish As the officers attempt their first undercover buy, Jim Scheider knows he is heading into dangerous territory. As soon as we turned the corner, my heart started racing. We knew that uh, there was no turning back at that point. Abdallah and Scheider look for a dealer, any dealer, to buy from. Then on a street corner, they spot Vincent Hill, flanked by his lieutenants. The K Street crew is out in force. What y'all need? I'm gonna get a couple bags. Dalla doesn't think twice. He gets out of the truck. And I'd asked if I could get two bags for 40, which meant two bags of marijuana, uh, which were $50, but if I could, I'd get them for $40 a piece. An individual to my left side ran to go get them from a stash, which was on a fence line. And Vincent Hill said, no, you'll take two for 50. I put the money down, and then I walked away. The surveillance team documents the entire transaction. They now have the leader of the K Street crew on videotape, personally selling marijuana to undercover officers. Joe walked into Vincent Hill the first time, and we said, wow, this is too easy. Within 30 seconds, the deal was done. Jim and Joe rolled back to the office, and we were just amazed. The task force has been prepared to wait weeks, even months, to make contact with Hill. But it happened in less than a minute. The FBI presses their advantage. Over the next six months, they continue to buy marijuana directly from Hill, gradually increasing the quantity. Each time, the sale is carefully photographed. He was there. He never touched the drugs. Through the undercover buys, investigators discover that Hill controls everything that happens on the block. This becomes clear when Abdallah and Scheider try to make a purchase from someone other than Hill. And we were getting ready to make a purchase. And there was someone hollering down the street. When we looked back, it was Vincent Hill. We went back down into the block, met with Vincent Hill and bought from him. And I think he had that kind of power in that block. For months, the buys go on like clockwork. Abdallah is doing more than making purchases. He's building a relationship. Slowly, he gains Hill's trust and tries to get information. I try to get any conversations I could from him. And there were times when I'd try and draw a conversation from him where he would say, look, if the police come in the block, I have a place to run to, you don't. So tell me what you need, let's get it over with. And there were also times when I had a conversation with him about setting up weight purchases, or you know, more than the $20 bag, what we would call wholesale quantities, like quarter pounds. Abdallah begins buying in bulk, moving from ounces to pounds. He tells Hill he is selling marijuana at the construction site where he works. There were occasions when he would actually front me drugs, which would mean he'd give them to me for free for payment at a later date. We had that kind of trust. And he even gave me good advice on when buying the weight. He would supply me with the smaller $20 bags. He gave me uh, packages of those at some points, and he would tell me how to juggle it or I mean break it down and sell it in the quantities to my friends. And he gave me helpful hints on how to do that. For six months, the operation runs smoothly. Then, a routine buy puts everyone on guard. Well, at one point, when I made a buy from him, I got back into the truck, and Jimmy was driving, and I was in the passenger seat, and Jimmy said, hey, he's, he's waving at you. And he was motioning like to roll the window down. So I rolled the window down, and he said, hey, look, these guys over here, they're saying that your buddy's a police officer. He said, I know you're OK, but he said, those guys over there will kill you. Somebody tell me what's going on, police. I know y'all can't play me like that, right? And it, it, it threw us off a little bit, and then when we started to leave, 
the guys that he was pointing to had like hoods over their faces and put their heads away from us. It does not appear to Abdallah and Scheider that Hill suspects they are cops. So they continue the operation. A week later, the two detectives pull into K Street. Vincent Hill is there. Hill was cold to me, didn't want anything to do with me, he said he didn't know where they sold marijuana, didn't know what I was talking about. And it was, it was very confusing, because even when he was angry and sold, he was just in a hurry. He said, what do you need? Hurry up and get out of here. But on this day, he's like, I don't have anything. I don't know what you're talking about. You can go somewhere else. Hill sends them to another dealer down the block. That night, Abdallah meets the dealer in an abandoned house. The officer prepares for a confrontation. The gentleman walked into a vacant house, called me in. Safe up here. The gentleman tried to give me like a sandwich baggie full of lawnmower clippings. It wasn't real marijuana. So it was that point, we knew something was wrong. Abdallah knows their cover is blown. With backup cars at least two minutes away, he slowly talks his way out of the building. The undercover operation is over. After six months of drug buys, the task force still does not have enough evidence to put Vincent Hill and his gang in prison once and for all. Had we charged him with the drug conspiracy alone, it might have gotten them 10 years, maybe five years. And what's even worse, they would have been held accountable for all the violent crimes they committed. So we still needed to investigate the murders and the robberies and the kidnappings and all the violent crimes that were associated with that group. Investigators still have a lot of work to do. In the meantime, the streets rage with violence. In Washington, D.C., a lengthy undercover operation has begun to produce results. Investigators have videotaped the infamous K Street crew selling drugs. But now, they must find evidence of the gang's more violent activities. In 1995, a brave young woman steps forward. So what would you like to Chrissy call? Gladden is 19 years old. You know, that you can share with us. As a single mother, she is worried about her neighborhood. Okay. We know you're scared. He's a scary Chrissy person. tells police that Jerome Martin and Antonio Knight are responsible for a drive-by shooting. She overheard Martin talking about it. Although she doesn't know the victim's name, her description of the crime leads investigators to an unsolved murder. Six months earlier, Travis Ross had been killed in a drive-by shooting near K Street. Two of his friends were critically wounded. Chrissy wants to testify against the gang. She knows they are the reason her neighborhood is so dangerous. Still, she's afraid. She tells investigators that if she speaks out against the K Street crew, they will kill her. Chrissy Gladden and two other women finally agree to testify, but only if the FBI places them in the witness protection program. Special Agent Vince Lissy. We finally convinced Chrissy as well as these other female witnesses that we would work with them. We would try to keep them safe and make sure nothing happened to them. We stressed upon them not to tell people where they lived, not to take people to their new apartments. Chrissy's cooperation pays off. Crew members Jerome Martin and Antonio Knight are indicted for murder. All right, hold the slide up to your bicep. Lissy believes they have enough evidence to get a conviction. Even though one witness has recanted, 
two others, including Chrissy, are still willing to testify. It's not a big deal. The week before the trial of Jerome Martin, we're constantly re-interviewing witnesses, talking to them, getting them ready to testify. We want them to know what questions they're going to be asked if they take the stand to testify. And the week before, we had Christy in the U.S. Attorney's Office. We got her ready. She pretty much knew what was going to be expected of her. She wasn't an eyewitness to the murder, but she did fill in certain gaps. Four days before the start of the murder trial, Vince Lissy right. receives a call right, from one I'll of the witnesses. I'll set it up. She was frantic, okay. screaming, right. crying, uh, telling me they killed Christy, they killed Christy, Christy's dead. And I couldn't believe it. And then whenever I realized what she was talking about, it was like somebody punched me in the stomach. Agent Lissy drives over to the Southwest District. At the crime scene, Metro Police tell him what happened. Get that mark right away. Let's call forensics. According to witnesses, Chrissy attended a party on 37th Street at the home of Antonio Knight's girlfriend. As she left the party, two gunmen appeared and opened fire. By the time police arrived, Chrissy was already dead. Not surprisingly, investigators are unable to find a single witness willing to identify Chrissy's killers. The message from the K Street crew is clear. Talking to the police is a death sentence. Chrissy thought that everything was fine. She trusted her friends, she trusted the people in that neighborhood. Thought she could go back there, nothing was gonna happen. That was probably the worst I've ever felt in this job. It's hard, it's hard to keep going sometimes when that happens. Still, the task force pursues their case against Jerome Martin and Antonio Knight. The trial is a disaster. The case had lingered in the system so long in DC, we said, we gotta go. And we went forward with it and we did the best we could. Some witnesses were just physically unable to testify. They were just distraught. Um, but you know, we went forward and we lost. Jerome Martin and Antonio Knight are acquitted due to lack of evidence. To the K Street crew, witnesses like Chrissy Gladden are a minor inconvenience. It was really something to see these guys go free. And at that point, they won the battle. They were happy, they won the battle. And, and I told myself, I, you can't sit back and let them continue to win these battles. Chrissy Gladden's death and the acquittal of Martin and Knight are major blows to the investigation. The task force refuses to give up. Somehow, they will find a way to bring the K Street crew to justice. In Washington, D.C., the K Street crew is terrorizing a neighborhood with drugs and violence. Investigators spent months working with 19-year-old witness Chrissy Gladden, who agreed to testify against them. On October 5th, she was gunned down outside a party. Even without witnesses, Detective Steve Kirshner is determined to find her killers. We stayed on it trying to find a break in that case. And we did everything we could. We printed up flyers, uh, offered a reward. Uh, it, it really crushed the investigators uh, on the case, uh, especially Vince. It's horrible. It's just, you know, part of you says, what more can I do? That's it. You want to wave the white flag. But the other part of you says, wait a minute, I'm not going to give up. You know, I'm not going to give in to their ways of justice. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Less than a month later, the FBI and DC police get an unexpected break in the case. Robert Butchie Smith, a senior K Street crew member, is arrested for drug dealing. In an effort to get Smith to talk about the gang, the FBI tells him he faces federal racketeering charges. 
sign in here. They're building a RICO case that will tie the gang's drug business to a series of murders. The tactic works. Smith finally agrees to talk. Tell us what you know. Smith reveals that the gang uses private investigators to identify people willing to testify against them. They also use the Freedom of Information Act to obtain court documents to target potential witnesses. Smith gives investigators leads on several unsolved kidnappings, shootings, and murders, according to Metro Detective Tony Brigadini. He had very specific, protected information of the crimes and the business dealings that the members of the K Street crew participated in. Smith specifically mentions a triple homicide that his nephew, William Sweeney, told him about. Sweeney, along with Sam Carson and James Montgomery, are fellow members of the K Street crew. Smith said Sweeney and Carson were in Las Vegas when Ryan Pierce, another drug dealer, won big at the tables. The two men decided to rob Pierce when he returned to DC. On November 17th, 1996, Sweeney, Carson, and James Montgomery waited outside his home. Pierce arrived late that night, along with three friends. The K Street crew made their move. Where are you at, bro? What's up, man? What's this, man? Where your money at? Now, where money? Get over here. 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 Pierce told the gunman he had already put his winnings in the bank. There was no cash in the house. Man, this is crazy, man. I don't got no money in, man. Sweeney killed both men. One woman tried to flee, but was shot to death. Another woman managed to hide until the killers left. Get out of here, my son. Get out of here. According to Butchie Smith, the K Street crew usually kills people in response to a threat. But Pierce's murder was different. This time, it was all about greed. My nephew, Sweeney. Investigators hope that Smith's inside information is the break they need to finally bring down the gang. At that point, then we knew, OK, now we can start to get the framework of an indictment ready so that we could go and start to prepare charges against these guys for crimes other than the drugs. Smith agrees to become an FBI informant in exchange for a reduced sentence. It's a risky decision. I'm dead. I'm done. If anyone finds out he's talking to authorities, Vincent Hill will have him killed. Technicians analyze a single fingerprint found on a screen door at the murder scene. It matches Sweeney's prints, corroborating Butchie's story. What also helped us was we got William Sweeney's uh, cellular telephone records. And uh, some of the people working the case began to go and investigate that. And they contacted the cell phone company and found out that the cell phone was used near the scene of the triple murder at the time of the murder. Investigators moved quickly to neutralize Sweeney. In April 1997, he is arrested on unrelated charges. While awaiting trial in jail, Sweeney receives a copy of his own arrest warrant from his attorney. An unnamed source is listed as an informant against him. Two months later, just when it looks like the task force is about to put an end to the gang's operation, Robert Butchie Smith is gunned down in broad daylight. The FBI informant has been shot a total of 13 times, mostly in the head. When Butchie got killed, it brought back all these uh, feelings and the memories. And you know, it's hard. It's hard to keep going sometimes when that happens. 
much like Chrissy's murder, we, there were no leads. There were, although many people were out on the street and saw it that day, nobody would come forward, nobody talked. Butchie Smith's murder threatens to unravel the case against the K Street crew. Investigators have lost their only informant. The brutal killing scares away other potential witnesses. After Butchie's murder, we sat around looking at each other like, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? It really took a lot of the wind out of our sail. We had to figure out how we can continue with the investigation. Where were we going to go? We thought, okay, we can follow up with the leads Butch gave us, but still, we needed somebody on the inside, and we no longer had Butch to give it to us. We had to gather around and tell ourselves, we can't let this get us down. We can't stop. In 1997, the FBI's case against the notorious K Street crew was in trouble. The only informant had been murdered, gunned down in cold blood. Other potential witnesses are terrified they'll meet the same fate. Before he was killed, FBI informant Butchie Smith told investigators that James Montgomery was one of the men responsible for a triple homicide. Montgomery is arrested and brought in for questioning. Mr. Montgomery, interesting. You got like three Special murders. Agent Vince Lissy pressures the suspect to talk about the triple homicide and the rest of the gang's crimes. Montgomery is already facing a long prison term for the murders. Anyone tell me about anything? You know. In the end, he decides to cooperate. Montgomery admits his role in the triple homicide. He also confesses to seven murders, including that of cooperating witness Chrissy Gladden. Lissy presses for more leads on crimes committed by the gang. Montgomery reveals that crew member Sam Carson killed informant Butchie Smith. What else you that, Carson? Then he drops a bombshell. He told me, do you remember when the two girls got killed? And I asked him, which two girls? And he said, the ones back in the early 90s. I knew exactly what he meant. Montgomery is referring to the unsolved murders of Teresa and Tarita Lucas. And he began to tell me about it, and I just couldn't believe it. What do you want, Sam? I just want to come in and talk to you for one or two minutes. According to Montgomery, Sam Carson had stashed a bag of guns at the home of his girlfriend, Teresa Lucas. When he asked her to return the guns, Teresa claimed she didn't have them. She didn't want them around her children, so she threw them away. Can I use the bathroom real quick? Yeah. Carson was furious. He decided to confront Teresa one final time. Carson hid his handgun in the bathroom. He tried to calm Teresa's fears by showing her he was unarmed. You know what this is about. I want my guns, Teresa. He began again to ask her, where's my gun? I need my gun. Where did you put them? No, nobody has them. Sam, I just threw them out. I want them right now. No, Sam, there are children in the house. I want my guns. she gave him an answer that wasn't satisfactory. All right, you want me to go? Just go. You want me to go, right? I get out. He went back to the bathroom, retrieved his gun. Killed her. Sam walked into the bedroom, and as Tarita was waking up and starting to sit up in bed, he shot and killed her. According to Montgomery, Carson got rid of any evidence that linked him to the crime scene. Took his time. When he was satisfied that he had removed any photos, wiped all his fingerprints, he walked from the apartment, got in the car, and left. Investigators asked Montgomery how the crew had discovered the identities of two undercover police officers 
Joe Abdallah and Jim Scheider. Montgomery admits that someone from the other side of town recognized them as law enforcement and told Vincent Hill. Oh, there was this girl. Although Hill didn't believe it at first, he soon became suspicious, according to investigator Joe Abdallah. On a subsequent buy we made after that day, they followed us in the truck as we left and followed us back to the FBI building where was our, our meeting spot after the buys took place. And that's the date they quit selling to us. Lissy isn't taking any chances with this witness. He decides to move Montgomery out of state for his own protection. In the fall of 1997, Montgomery pleads guilty to seven murders. As part of the plea agreement, the court seals details of his sentence and whereabouts. I have a warrant for your arrest. Put your hands on your head now. Police arrest Sam Carson and charge him with the murder of Teresa and Tarita Lucas. William Sweeney, already in jail on unrelated charges, is indicted for the triple homicide. With Montgomery safely hidden, law enforcement begins to dismantle the K Street crew's infrastructure. Jerome Martin, Sean Coates, and gang leader Vincent Hill are arrested in the summer of 1998. A federal indictment charges the gang with 13 murders 87 counts of racketeering, drug distribution, kidnappings, and robberies. A federal judge permits recorded testimony from Chrissy Gladden yeah. and Robert Butchie Smith to be introduced at trial. Even in death, the gang's victims point a finger at their killers. In 2001, every gang member charged with murder is convicted. They receive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Gang members not accused of murder plead guilty to charges ranging from kidnapping to drug trafficking. There's no doubt in my mind that if these guys stayed on the street, they would have continued doing what they were doing. That was their life. They knew how to sell drugs, how to rob people, how to kill people. Thanks to the tireless efforts of both the FBI and DC Metro Police, K Street is now a safer place to live. A string of vicious bank robberies grows more violent with every holder, then ends in a deadly shootout. With a dangerous man on the run, Police conduct an all-out search for a fugitive so desperate he will stop at nothing to make his escape. bank robbers hit a Seattle bank, taking over $150,000. But before they can escape, police confront them and the pair splits up. As authorities search block by block, they learn one was a career criminal with a long history of violence. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The suspect was smart and desperate to stay free. Agents chased him through the Caribbean and across cyberspace, determined to put an end to his career.
one of the FBI's primary responsibilities is investigating bank robberies. And they see more of these crimes in Seattle than just about any other place in the country. The FBI office there investigates every bank robbery in the state of Washington. Special Agent Mike Adams runs Seattle's robbery division. Over the last five or six years, we've averaged 300 bank robberies a year, primarily here in the Seattle or King County area. Bank robberies are a big problem here in this area. The FBI cites a high rate of drug addiction, and the fact that Washington has a relatively large number of bank branches is reasons for this. The Seattle agents see two basic types of bank heists. Most are one-on-one -on -one robberies, when someone approaches a teller with a note and a quiet demand for cash. Not necessarily a robber who cares to draw attention to him or herself by being extremely vocal or attempting to take over the banking operations. The other kind of robbery is more rare and more dangerous. The takeover. A takeover robbery is where we have one or more robbers who enter a bank and attempt to take over the banking operations through various means, either ordering people to the floor or ordering bank employees away from the teller counters. More often than not, in a takeover-style bank robbery, the bank robber or robbers are armed with firearms. So those are considered very violent as opposed to a one-on-one -on -one style bank robbery. Agents note that whenever takeover bandits get away with it, they will usually rob again, becoming bolder and more violent with each new attempt. On May 17, 2000, one particularly vicious string of takeover-style robberies begins at a downtown Seattle bank. Working quickly, they disappear in minutes with thousands of dollars in cash. A week later, thieves hit another area bank, brandishing bigger guns intensifying their assault on unsuspecting patrons and employees. Two weeks later, robbers strike again with even more aggression. Since takeover robberies are rare, agents believe the crimes were all perpetrated by the same bandits. We did see bank robberies that did appear to be similar in nature in terms of the level of violence, in terms of large amounts of money, Certainly, you know, a robbery of that nature is going to pique our attention because of the significant level of violence. Yet each time, the robbers escape cleanly in stolen getaway cars, leaving no eyewitnesses who can ID the men. The FBI is facing a pair of seasoned criminals who grow more aggressive with each attack. Recognizing a pattern of behavior, Authorities feel these violent robbers will turn deadly. Six days later, on the morning of June 22, 2000, their worst fears are realized. Two men head down Aurora Avenue, then turn into the parking lot of Wells Fargo Bank. People inside have no idea what's coming. The gunmen corral the customers and employees, but they miss one. The robbers are organized. One stands guard while the other finds a teller who can access the vault. I'm asking you, do you have the key to the vault? Don't look at me. The manager connects with police emergency. Stay in line. All units had a bank robbery at 120 in Aurora. 
A dispatcher puts out an urgent call about armed robbers still inside the bank. Two or four received. Seattle officer Wesley Buxton responds. It was a bank robbery in progress. That's a little bit of an unusual call. We usually get bank alarms as opposed to bank robbery in progress. Buxton races to the bank. I'm bad. Hurry up. Yeah. Come on. Here, here, fill it up. Hurry up. Inside the vault, the thief takes all the cash his two Hurry backpacks up. can hold. The teller follows orders, hoping the gunman won't kill him. No, no phone calls or nothing. You understand me? None of that. Buxton kills his siren as he approaches the bank. I was the first one on the scene. Uh, um, there was a, a motorcycle sitting out in front of the bank. I believe it was up on the sidewalk. You really couldn't see in the bank. Following procedure, the officer finds cover and waits for backup. Officer Rick Sprecher arrives and gets into position. The bandits emerge, unaware of the officers. They cannot get the motorcycle started. They sat there like they were frozen for a minute in time. I guess trying to figure out why the motorcycle would it start. And then they jumped off the motorcycle and they started running away from it. Then one suspect trips. I had my gun on him and told him to stay down. Buxton stays with the first gunman. Officer Sprecher orders the second to stop. But the man disappears. Then Officer Buxton is suddenly faced with the unthinkable. It seemed like slow motion. I've heard the tape recording of it, and the shots were fired in quick succession. But at that time, it seemed like there were even maybe one or two seconds between the actual shots. Sprecher returns fire finally stopping the gunman. Officers contain one suspect. The other is gone. Got an officer down! Officer down! I need backup! Officer Sprecher's call brings an intense law enforcement response. Emergency medical technicians work to stabilize Officer Buxton while Officer Sprecher quickly briefs detectives. The man who shot the officer is dead. The hunt for the escaped suspect begins immediately. A dispatcher broadcasts a description of the fleeing gunman on all police channels. FBI agents rush to the bank. Among them, Agent Mike Adams. On my way to the bank, I did hear an officer was shot and was down. It was obviously a very violent uh, takeover style robbery. Adams recognizes that these initial reports are similar to the three earlier robberies and that the violence has escalated even further. With one armed gunman still on the loose, authorities quickly move to contain the situation. There were several people, bystanders, who were beginning to gather around. So Seattle police immediately took control of the scene because of the imminent danger and potential uh, threat that still existed. The Seattle Police Department directs their homicide unit to the scene, including Detective Paul Seguro. Anytime there's officer involved shooting where a Seattle police officer fires a weapon, we are called to investigate. All law enforcement agencies begin working together to develop a plan to find the escaped gunman. Seattle police form an emergency command post to coordinate the effort. Their assignment. Let's wrap it up right now. Take off. All right. Members of our SWAT team had already started a search of the inner perimeter area. Moving toward the general direction of the fleeing suspect, SWAT methodically searches every hiding space. 
They are careful, knowing that the gunman is desperate and could be anywhere. Concerned for public safety, law enforcement swarms the area. Roads are blocked, traffic rerouted. Detective Sergeant David Ritter. The bank robbery and uh, subsequent police shooting led to a tremendous police presence in the area. We had dogs, we had uh, the King County helicopter, um, the special weapons team. The SWAT team goes door to door, warning everyone in the business district. Anybody in here with me down the street? Businesses were shut down. We closed all the local businesses for the safety of the people because the suspect was still at large. Okay? You got it right. Just do that, please. Thank you. After treating gunshot wounds in Officer Buxton's left arm and right shoulder, the emergency medical technicians take him to the hospital. Both wounds, the bullet uh, went in and out, um, so it was just a matter of clearing, cleaning it up and making sure there wasn't anything that would cause any kind of infection. Special Agent Adams searches the downed bank robber for clues. I pulled out his identification, which said his name was Daniel Del Fierro. He was not someone that, uh, known to the FBI at that time, but nonetheless, uh, certainly um, a name for us to conduct further follow-up investigation. Investigators locate the 380 semi-automatic handgun used to shoot Buxton. In a belt pack, they find a 38 revolver. Agents also recover two backpacks full of cash. A lot of the money in there was still in shrink wrap, delivered from the Federal Reserve Bank. Later, the money found in both backpacks came up to well over $151,000. That is a lot of money, much more than is typically taken during a bank robbery. Police run the plates of the motorcycle and learn it will not help them ID the escaped suspect. The bike was stolen. FBI agents interview bank employees and customers, searching for clues that might help them locate the second gunman. But the robbers never used any names, and no one saw their faces. An evidence technician recovers a footprint left on the teller counter. But it is the only physical evidence investigators find at the scene. The heist was clean. Local police pull up the record of the dead robber, Daniel Del Fierro. He was fresh out of prison, having served time for manslaughter and assault. Police continue to hunt down Del Fierro's accomplice. Within hours of the robbery, they pick up his trail. Detectives respond to a nearby junkyard where officers have recovered evidence. We are backtracking, finding the items of evidence that were discarded. As he's running, he's getting rid of his motorcycle helmet. He had on gloves. It's sort of like the trail that he left behind. And he continues running, probably another 50 feet. And he took off his jacket. There's a high chain link fence and barbed wire on top of that. There's also a handgun, a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol covered close to the jacket. Investigators suspect that the gunman was covering his trail by leaving behind evidence and any clothing that would later identify him. But just as the suspect's trail appears to be getting cold, it heats up again. Zero. I'll be right there. Gotta go. Investigators head to a nearby apartment building, responding to a call made by the building's manager. Excuse me, ma'am. You don't want to call the police earlier. She had called police after finding fresh blood outside an apartment. Anything unusual? Went upstairs to my apartment and noticed the blood on the stairwell. Did you see any? Surmised that the second suspect must have cut his hand going over the fence. If it is the gunman's blood, he could still be in the building, armed and desperate. Okay, Police SWAT call for down SWAT. Down right, the the way. We'll get you to a safe spot. And a nearby team arrives immediately. With a dangerous and elusive gunman still on the loose, police hope they now have him cornered. 
Following a Seattle bank robbery in June 2000, a gun battle leaves one police officer injured and one suspect dead. A second armed suspect flees on foot and disappears. Police follow a blood trail to a nearby apartment building. Thinking the gunman might be holed up there, a SWAT team checks the place, one hallway, one apartment at a time. They're the top, come on! But they find nothing. Once the building is cleared, investigators secure a sample of the blood for later testing. Authorities pour every resource into the intense manhunt, according to Detective Sergeant David Ritter. Because of the seriousness of the robbery, every available officer that we could find was involved in this uh, hunt for the second suspect. Police are cautious, knowing from experience that someone willing to shoot a cop is far more dangerous than the average criminal. FBI agents approach residents, asking them what they've seen and warning them about the fugitive. The suspect was obviously very dangerous, and the people in the immediate area were afraid. Tactical officers continue to check buildings, alleys, any place the suspect could hide. Clear, clear, let's go, next one. They instruct every business in a 15-block area to shut down and lock up. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks. thanks. In no time, authorities seal off one of Seattle's busiest shopping districts, bringing the entire area to a standstill. Investigators have identified the suspect killed during the shootout as Danny Del Fierro. He is the investigator's best lead for locating the second robber. King County Deputy Prosecutor Steve Fogg. So we got an immediate warrant for his residence, his car, to try to locate whatever information we could about him, and through that, who he might have done the crime with. At Del Fierro's home, investigators meet a woman who had lived with him. She says she knows nothing about the robbery, but helps them compile a list of her housemate's associates. Investigators then search Del Fierro's home, but find nothing that can help them identify the escaped suspect. Across town, officers respond to a call from a man who claims he was the target of an attempted carjacking. It is just north of the building where the blood was found. The driver explains that minutes earlier, he was leaving his apartment complex. All of a sudden, he saw this guy jump out in front of him and slam both of his hands down on the hood and force him to stop. The guy said, hey, I've been in a fight, and I need you to help me. Can you give me a ride? The man became more aggressive. He put his hand into the car, tried to grab the keys, and tried to take the car himself. When it became apparent that um, that was not going to work, he became quite vicious, you know, within you know, a matter of seconds. The owner of the car was able to fight him off, push him out the door, um, and then just uh, jet off as fast as he could. He um, reported what had happened to a police officer. Police are convinced the carjacker is the robber they're pursuing. The victim gives them a detailed description of his assailant and the direction he was going. He was moving to the north, so that moved the search in that direction. We got the description out immediately, and the media was helpful, and they got it out to the public uh, as fast as we had it. For three hours, investigators find no sign of the fugitive until a 911 operator gets a call. My wife and I, we've been mugged. A man reports yeah. that he and his wife had been held hostage that afternoon. The intruder had fled, but they think he was the Man's bank robber hostage. they heard about on the news. Yes, the one that robbed the bank. Investigators race to a residence north of the carjacking attempt. The couple explains what happened. Three hours earlier, the woman was leaving her house when she saw a man in her truck. 
He was calm and told her he'd been in a fight and needed her help. She didn't fall for it. At this point, the police and the media were sort of circling the area. And she pointed up to the helicopters and said, no, I think actually they're looking for you. And again, the personality changed just like that. The woman is not somebody who's just going to kind of roll over for this guy. She tried to fight back. He grabbed a knife, uh, let her know that he was capable of using it. He signaled to her that his own survival was at stake and he was going to be as brutal as he had to be. Where's the tape? Tell me right now, where's the tape? Do you have any rope? Don't move. As he searched for something with which to tie her up, her husband came home. Honey. Honey. Where are you? Hey. I'm home. Honey. The husband then tried to intervene on behalf of his wife, and uh, this guy punched him. Stop moving. Stop moving. Give me your hands. Give me your hands. I'll At this kill you. point, they were just doing what they needed to do to survive, and so they said, I think they felt like if they were tied up, at least they wouldn't be shot or anything like that. The couple could hear the assailant making calls on his cell phone in another room. Campbell Road. Not from the window, okay? Then he calmly got a beer from the refrigerator and began watching accounts of his own robbery on television. He seemed transfixed by live images of the extensive manhunt. About two and a half, three hours after they were tied up, there was a knock on the window, um, and he sort of ran out the uh, door, and um, that was the last they ever saw of him. By the time police respond, it's clear the suspect has slipped through their dragnet. Once we interviewed the people in the house, then it was pretty obvious that he had gotten away. The intensive search ended when it was obvious that he had fled the scene and he had had some help from somebody else, uh, probably a car. So the actual physical search of the area was pretty much stopped at that time. Investigators processed the entire house, collecting fingerprints and blood samples. They hope the evidence will help them identify a dangerous criminal, a man who will do anything to escape the law. An armed bank robber is on the run, following a deadly shootout in which police kill his partner. During his flight, the fugitive assaults a couple, then holds them hostage in their Seattle home while he waits for a getaway driver to help him escape. FBI Special Agent Gary Shaneline knows this fugitive is especially dangerous. The nature of the act itself of bank robbery is very violent, but in trying to effect an escape, his partner and he uh, were involved in the shooting of a, a police officer and also the taking hostage of innocent citizens. So the stakes in this particular case were definitely higher. Detective Paul Seguro begins canvassing the neighbors of the slain robber, Danny Del Fierro. One so man tells Seguro he had seen television reports about the stolen motorcycle used in the robbery and he recognized it. He saw Del Frio with the motorcycle prior to the bank robbery taking place. The man tells Seguro he saw the bike on a tow truck. And this individual had seen another individual inside the truck with Del Frio the day before. Seguro thinks the tow truck driver might be the second robber. He asks the neighbor if he knows who he is. The man says he had never seen him before. The owners of the bank that was robbed tried to help, according to FBI Special Agent Mike Adams. That very day, the bank came to us and wanted to offer a reward for information that would lead to the, the identity, arrest, and eventual conviction of the person or persons responsible for that armed bank robbery. Agents hope the large reward will make people more willing to talk. 
myself, other FBI agents spent many long hours attempting to gather as much information as we could. Investigators tracked down every possible lead, trying to get more information on Del Fierro's known associates. We drove to you know, several different addresses and locations in our attempt to interview different people who we thought might be able to lead to the identity as well as the location of the second suspect of this bank robbery. Every lead becomes a dead end. Investigators finally get a break when officers begin processing the evidence left behind by the fleeing robber. Inside the jacket was this piece of paper that had a photocopy of a driver's license that belonged to a young 16-year-old uh, girl, and then a lot of uh, information about who she was. Police begin looking for the young woman. They called the best number they had for her, which was her dad. And her dad said, well, she's at the movies. Um, and they said, well, you know, you need to get her. So she came and talked to the police, and she said that as soon as her dad came into the movie there, she immediately knew what it was about. Basically, the reason why I asked is because they show her the photocopied license and ask how the bank robbers got it. She told us that she was approached by a person she went to high school with. Uh, the person she went to high school with said, I have an individual that has large sums of money. Uh, he needs ID and social security numbers. In return, you'll get a couple thousand dollars if you let us use your ID and social security number. The young woman explains the information was to be used to set up bank accounts to launder stolen money. She gives detectives the name of her high school friend, the middleman for the ID fraud. So what is this all about? Detectives track down the man and try to get him to cooperate. We contacted him early morning hours. Uh, he was somewhat reluctant to talk to us at first, but then as we started talking to him, we finally started to tell us about who it was that asked him to obtain the identification social security numbers. His name is Aristotle. He tells detectives the man's name is Aristotle Marr. We then thought that it's very possible that Aristotle Marr is the person we're looking for because he was obviously looking for a way to launder money in the hopes of getting legitimate funds in return. Investigators are convinced they're on the right track when the middleman tells investigators that Marr owns a towing service. Police conduct a background check. DMV records reveal that there is a tow truck registered to Mar, and that it matches the one described by Del Fierro's neighbor. Investigators return to Del Fierro's home to ask his old roommate if she knows Aristotle Mar. She says Mar and Del Fierro had been friends since childhood. So now his name had come up in two different sources or two different ways during the investigation. So now we started to focus on Aristotle Mar as being the second suspect involved in the bank robbery. Authorities check Mar's police record. It's clean except for one assault charge he received as a minor. Tax records show Marr runs a successful towing business and already owns property worth $400,000. Police are surprised to learn he was a star athlete in high school, graduating six years earlier with a 4.0 grade point average. The first thing everybody said about him was uh, how smart he was. And you could see he had a lot of potential in life, but was impatient enough. And I think that that fed directly into the greed that motivated these crimes. Steve Fogg subpoenas the cell phone records of Marr and Del Fierro. He discovers calls made between the two suspects prior to the robbery, circumstantial evidence that they were possibly in the planning stages. Danny Del Fierro and Aristotle Marr were talking, you know, 10 times an hour in the days and weeks that preceded this. Police then ask witnesses to confirm Marr's identity. To do this, they create a photo montage. It's typically what happens is you have six photos, and the person who's the suspect is one of uh, the six. Here, the police put together uh, a 12-person montage. They really went the, the extra mile just to make absolutely certain that we had the right guy. Authorities show the photo montage to the woman who was assaulted and held hostage in her home. And she didn't have any hesitation at all. She picked out uh, Mr. Marr immediately. 
Later, her husband and the carjacking victim would also pick out Mar as their attacker. So with that, I take it together with all the circumstantial evidence, we were quite confident that Aristotle Mar was uh, the guy we were looking for. Go. Go. Authorities secure an arrest warrant for Mar and a search warrant for his home. Knowing Mar's volatile tendencies, police prepare for what could be a violent confrontation. On June 22, 2000, a pair of alleged serial bank robbers hit another Seattle bank. During a shootout with police, one bandit is killed, and the other escapes. The dead robber is Daniel Del Fierro. Authorities believe the fugitive is Aristotle Marr. Fearing a violent confrontation, police prepare to serve arrest and search warrants with the help of a tactical unit. With the team are homicide detectives Paul Seguro and David Ritter. When we went to uh, the residence, we had members of the SWAT team, multiple Seattle police units uh, to assist us in securing the premise. Room by room, SWAT searches the house. They find no sign of Mar. Homicide detective Paul Segura. Once the home is secured, myself and the rest of the homicide unit went in and started searching through the, the home. Something real quick. They look for any evidence that can tie Mar to the robbery or provide a clue to his whereabouts. In a hidden storage area, they find remnants of an arsenal. Look at that. Yeah, there it is. Look at that. Detectives recover empty containers for various types of handguns. Reach for that yeah. Although they do find Check a few weapons, most of the guns are gone. There was different types of ammunition for long guns, shotguns. There was ammunition for handguns. Detectives begin looking at the bullets more closely and uncover an important piece of evidence. We found ammunition that matched ammunition that we found at the scene of the bank robbery. Authorities also discover another lead, documents that show frequent travel to and from Jamaica by Marr and several associates. Also, there was uh, small photographs and templates for the making of what appeared to be false identification. Investigators suspect that Marr may have plans to flee the country under a false name. During the search at Marr's home, authorities discover a second house on the property. Excuse me, Bob. We need that house cleared over there. Agents immediately file a search warrant for the place and set up surveillance while they wait for the warrant to be processed. For a week, authorities watch people come and go but see no sign of the robbery suspect. When a judge finally issues the warrant, SWAT goes in. What they find spins the investigation in another direction. The building is a storage unit for stolen goods. Found uh, numerous boxes, brand new appliances, writing lawnmowers that were brand new, refrigerators, uh, numerous uh, cellular phones, and just all kinds of items that were still intact, brand new, still in the box. Investigators find packing lists still attached to the items, indicating they came from local home improvement stores. It was obvious to us that Aristotle Mar was involved in a bigger criminal enterprise than just bank robberies. The items were large, there were appliances, there were pallets of windows, big things, stuff that somebody doesn't go in and shoplift. I mean, these were, these were big items and showed uh, that there had to be some pretty sophisticated means to obtain this property. 
it was obvious that we needed help from our burglary and theft people. They coordinated the recovery of the property. The burglary and theft division worked with representatives from the local stores to identify more than $100,000 worth of stolen goods. Representatives provided a big, large movie van, and all the items that were identified as being stolen or suspicious were then loaded in the back of the movie van and taken off the property. Investigators suspect that Marr must have had help obtaining and selling the items. We believe a lot of the stolen property was sent to Jamaica. There just was some indication, some receipts, uh, shipping uh, receipts, etc., that showed uh, a large amount of household goods going to Jamaica. Authorities intensify their search for the alleged crime ringleader, Aristotle Marr. The Seattle FBI's Fugitive Task Force takes the lead. Special Agent Gary Shaneline. Well, we started with the fundamentals by you know, contacting his family and associates in the hopes of you know, finding that person that could you know, give us the information that would lead to a you know, safe and swift you know, apprehension. But every person agents interview claims no knowledge of Mars' whereabouts. Within weeks, the search for Mars begins to take its toll on the fugitive. In an unexpected bold move, a group of Marr supporters, including his lawyer, holds a press conference proclaiming his innocence. They charge police have falsely accused him because of his association with Daniel Del Fierro. Agents speak with lawyers about arranging surrender, but instead hear a preposterous claim. We try to have him turn himself in in a safe manner in, in a controlled environment. And they uh, said that he was, you know, afraid that he was going to be, you know, killed by the local police. Mar remains a fugitive. The FBI takes a new approach. They seek the help of a national television crime show, advertising a $25,000 reward for information leading to Mar's arrest. The tips pour in. One caller claims he's been in contact with Marr through a popular web-based instant messaging system. Agents subpoena the internet provider for details on the instant messaging account and receive transcripts of the online conversations. Through the content of the dialogue on the instant messaging communication, it was logical to, to believe that, that uh, one of the participants was Aristotle Marr. The company provides agents with the address of the computer used. We approached it with the belief that it was possible that uh, Mark could be there at that time. Open up. Armed with a search warrant, they confront a man who they recognize as a known associate of Mark. Sure? He says Mar isn't there. No. Agents conduct a thorough search for any evidence that could prove the fugitive had been in the apartment, but they find nothing. Agents confiscate the computer in question. They eventually determined that Marr had probably never used the computer, that it had been the associate pretending to be Marr on the instant messaging system. The investigator's latest lead is a dead end. That search really didn't glean any further information regarding Aristotle's whereabouts. The FBI continues surveillance at the houses of family and friends, but soon realize Marr may never return. You know, unlike your, your garden variety bank robber, Aristotle Marr did have some financial means. He had owned property at a, at a rental house, and I'm sure that those assets and those means, you know, helped him in his fugitive status. An informant calls the FBI with a tip that appears to support what agents already fear. A confidential source indicated that he had fled under an alias, that he had not just crossed a state line, but actually had fled the country, and that he had fled to Jamaica. If Marr has indeed left the country under another name, he might be impossible to find. The FBI is now facing their toughest obstacle in a case that appears impossible to crack. 
The FBI continues to hunt for bank robbery suspect Aristotle Marr. They believe he fled to Jamaica under an assumed name. But the FBI cannot simply go after him, according to Special Agent Gary Shaneline. We don't have any you know, police authority in other countries, so uh, there are FBI representatives and there's uh, U.S. Marshals in Jamaica that uh, liaise with uh, Jamaican authorities, and uh, I was providing them with all the information that we were gleaning from our investigation here, uh, giving them names and uh, points of contact, possible locations that were worthy of investigation in Jamaica in the pursuit of Mar. Investigating Mar's whereabouts in Jamaica is difficult. He's well connected on the island and has a lot of money to help him disappear. We're confident that through those resources that he was able to maintain a, a low profile and, and have different places to go to to, uh, to hide himself. Informants report occasional sightings of the fugitive, but he eludes capture. Agents believe he is moving from house to house under cover of night, supported by a loyal group of associates. Following the leads from agents in the United States, authorities in Jamaica relentlessly pursue the fugitive. They contact every known associate of Aristotle Marr. They are uncooperative, but authorities keep them under surveillance. Aristotle Marr. Marshals were watching everything they did down in Jamaica. They made it very clear that they were not going to go away uh, until Mr. Marr returned to the United States and answered to these charges. In Seattle, King County Deputy Prosecutor Steve Fogg decides to file several charges against the fugitive based on the abundance of circumstantial evidence already in hand. We charged him with uh, an array of counts that reflected the, the full nature of this crime spree. Outside, we charged him with robbery in the first degree with the firearm enhancement because he was armed when that happened. We charged him as an accomplice with Danny Del Fierro to the shooting of Officer Buxton. We charged him with the temp robbery too, which is a, a formal way of saying attempted carjacking. And then kidnappings because they were essentially kidnapped and held hostage in their own basement. Steve Fogg also suspects Marr is involved in an international theft ring, but decides not to press charges. Mr. Marr was already looking at so much time that the amount of additional time that would be added by this theft ring would be negligible. I mean, you're talking about a year or two on a guy who's looking at, you know, 30, 40, 50 years in prison. So we did not um, charge Mr. Marr for that. Authorities intensify their search for Marr. Seattle homicide detective David Ritter. We kept the pressure up. Give me a break. Please. I mean, they felt our presence. They made several complaints that we were harassing them. But we weren't. We were conducting an investigation of a very violent crime, and we wanted to solve it. We wanted him in custody. It got the whole situation uh, probably too hot for him. He didn't, uh, he wasn't having much fun anymore. After seven months, the constant pressure pays off. On February 7th, 2001, Aristotle Marr shocks police, walking into the King County Jail with his lawyer. Why don't you go up to the counter, put your hands where I can see him. Seattle Police Detective Paul Seguro had chased Marr from the beginning. Sergeant Christopher, this is Tebow down at the watch desk. Aristotle Marr just turned himself in. I was surprised that Aristotle Moore had actually took it upon himself to turn himself in. We tried to talk to Aristotle Moore, interview him about the robberies, where he'd been. Um, he did not wish to talk about any aspects of the investigation at all. Authorities believe he has come back to take the pressure off his associates, and because he is sure the charges will never stick. He was quite confident, in fact, probably cocky, that um, uh, this would be a, a case that he could beat in court. He could come back, beat this case, um, and, and kill two birds with one stone. At his arraignment, Marr pleads not guilty to all charges. One advantage that 
uh, Mr. Marr had by fleeing was he could sit back and watch our case develop. And I had no doubt that he'd have an explanation for all the evidence, and we would have a real fight on our hands at trial. Marr's defense team knows that lab examiners have found his fingerprints on items dropped outside the bank, including the motorcycle helmet and a pair of gloves. They explain the prints by claiming Marr lent the items to Daniel Del Fierro, the suspect killed in the shootout. What Mr. Marr didn't know about, but we of course knew about, was this blood trail that had been left. I knew that the next step was to get an immediate sample of his blood. And I knew that you know, that would definitely be the silver bullet if we were able to develop DNA information from the blood trail that was left. A judge orders Marr to submit the samples, which DNA experts compare to blood found at the apartment complex and inside the kidnapped couple's house and truck. The examiner reports a match. At that point, uh, any concern we had about the outcome of that case definitely uh, lifted because uh, you know, it was clear that um, taken together with all the other evidence that we already had, that you know, this was a rock solid case. Marr decides not to risk a jury trial and changes his plea to guilty. He is sentenced to 23 years in prison with no chance of parole. Seattle police officer Wesley Buxton, shot during his confrontation with Marr and Del Fierro, is relieved that Marr finally got what he deserved. I'm probably your typical police officer that feels that criminals should get much more than they actually get as far as uh, the demands of justice. Um, but I was fairly satisfied with the sentence. Special Agent Mike Adams. Given the high number of bank robberies we have every year, on average, well over 300 bank robberies, here in the state of Washington. It's a good feeling when we can bring about or at least help bring about a successful conclusion to um, such a high profile bank robbery investigation. In the end, it was the combined efforts of the Seattle Police Department and the FBI that finally put Aristotle Marr out of business. <laughs> <laughs>